No, it is your mistake and your loss. This is the end of your career. Yeah, live from the mitten. That's the lands and shit. Chuck Chan on the beat though. Yo, yo, yo. Rapping raw, straight up out the Pyrex. Pockets bulging like a bicep. Now that's how I flex. You got some gall. You think you hard? No, not at all. You soft as a cotton ball. Watch your jaw. I knock it off. Whipping words up in pots and jars. Hard like chewing pasta raw. Flying saucer bars. Every line in the connect. Enter my mind, my intellect. Energized, look alive, cause I've been a threat. Relying on the God in me, no mystery. In the booth, shooting like Pistol Pete. This a breeze. My whole life like a lucid dream Infectious like a new disease Got him saying who is he? Uh, hey yo, what's up? Who you thought it was? Got it out the mud Most of y'all just bought your buzz You know the fame is a grave addiction I made something out of scraps like slaves and chitlins We take a slice of bread, then we make a loaf The circle small, prick your finger, then you take a oath All the war, we humble them and then we take control Raw, no bacon, so the dog hope you taking notes We take a slice of bread, then we make a loaf The circle small, prick your finger, then you take a oath All the war, we humble them and then we take control Raw, no bacon, so the dog hope you take it Dope notes. shit, swanna gnosis, I got explosives Strapped to the house of the POTUS Take notice, the goldsmith Watch me hang niggas with no rope, it's the most potent Virtual soul like Joseph, my island floating Like I leave parties like Moses, no Rift between me and my team, we taking O's, bitch Swanee lead a culture, telepathic force choke ya Favorite rapper, make them submit to the utmost Scenery cut Throat. Greenery much growth, profits abound exceedingly because my cuts gross off top ISIS. Meteor strikes hit your dome, spit your wig like we trying to search for life. It's the crisis. Take a seat before you get beheaded and be another conspiracy thread on Reddit, motherfucker. We take a slice of bread, then we make a loaf. The circle small, prick your finger, then you take a oath. All the war, we humble them and then we take control. Raw, no bacon, so the dog hope you taking notes. We take a slice of bread, then we make a loaf. The circle small, prick your finger, then you take a oath. All the war, we What? humble them and then Giant. we take control. Hey, Raw, no bacon, so the dog uh -huh. hope you taking notes. Nagasaki, niggas know the flow flame I don't play whole games, I argue with no name Rappers who invest they whole stock inside a gold chain You need cream if you go on ball, it's like Rogaine Eating beef low main, shine the walk, I swear that shit like cocaine Chief and I been hot for like the whole day You niggas wanna role play, nigga no way Tried to fit the whole thing in her mouth, she said okay Fucked it, then I'm out I'm on the run like OJ, she want a genuine man I told the bitch you not so late To keep it real with you, you more circus ole Expecting me to play a clown My moral compass helped me navigate my way around life My style nice, low sweater with the capital P Sean Price, uh Extra shrimp in my fried rice They say you only live once I nearly died twice, what? And we are now tuned in to episode 477. Damn it, this marathon just keeps on trucking. I am your host, King Eric, the media assassin. And we are now tuned in to the livest direct show on Friday night, Off the Cuff Radio, sponsored by Buddy Boy Entertainment, Jesse Boutique, Core Financial, Fleetwood and the Cotton Pickers, and Screwball Radio, T-Max with the facts on the line tonight with me. What's good, brother? What it do, what it do, man. Friday through and through, OTC up in the building. Shout out to our host, Mr. Sam and Sam Man, Lee Chinchilla. We are live and direct. What it do, King? Man, let me tell you something, brother. That track we just played, I've been nodding it so much, I got neck spasms, nigga. That's how you know you got one of the hardest joints out there. And this track here we just played, Title No Word was from this new album called This Late This This Late Lens. This project right here is possibly one of the hardest out there. If you ain't got it, you got to go get it. 
And on the line with us tonight, the star of the hour, to talk about this album, representing Michigan. Let's all welcome Substance 810, y'all. What up, what up, what up? How y'all doing, man? Welcome back, man. What's good? Chilling, chilling. It's good to be with y'all again to kick it. Appreciate y'all having yes, me back. Yes, sir, man. Yeah, man, it's been a long time coming, What's the man. Deal? Yeah, you back on, man. What's good with you, brother? How's how's everything going with you out there? Hey, things good, man. You know the album dropped like I don't know about six, seven days ago, man. And the feed, the feedback's been dope. Just uh, staying busy, man. It's it's cold out here in Michigan a little bit still. You know, we get into the spring a little bit, but uh, you know, same thing, man. Back on this grind. This is T Max, man. What's going on with you, man? Glad to have you with us, man. What up, homie? How you doing? I'm good, man. Great to have you. Great to have you live and direct with us, man. You know how it go. Absolutely, man. Salute to both of y'all. Appreciate y'all time. Definitely, man. Now, with the single we just played, No Worthy, you took it back to that rhymy feel, man. Like, you know, that 90s. Ice pick style, you know what I'm saying? Like, was that the direction you want to take with this <laughs> album? Honestly, um, you know my my music always got a, I would say like a, a nostalgic type of edge to it. You know what I mean? A, a golden era type of edge to it, uh, but with a modern twist. You know what I'm saying? But um, with me and Chuck Chan, when me and my guy Chuck Chan get together though, it's always like. Um, really intentionally dusty and 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 even more so of that type of lane, you know what I mean? Like, we really um, embody that when we get together. Like, we came up in the same time. We like a lot of the same music and shit, so, mm-hmm. you know, that's what we do. And the video, too, man. See, one thing I tell people, man, the video got to match the, the energy of the song, and y'all took it back to the basics even with the video. What was shooting the video like? Man, it was um, a shout-out to my dude Christopher Hoffman because I remember when I got the beat from Chuck, you know, the beat is just raw, you know what I mean? It's just drum and bass. It's just a banging joint, like the vocals stand out. So I wanted the video to be kind of um, to reflect the song. So we was, like, looking for places to shoot, and I came across this uh, that warehouse type of space. Um Shout out to, uh, to to them, you know what I mean, down, down there by uh, downtown Detroit by the water. It's like just a spot you would never know was there, you know what I mean, until you was there to do some work. So when I when I walked in and seen the spot, it kind of looked like everything was still under construction, but it was like supposed to be like that. But it, it man, it, it, was, it was a perfect spot for what we wanted to do. And the video turned out perfect, man. Shout out to my dude Christopher Hoffman, he, he killed that. Yeah, and you know what was dope about the song, too, is that you also included the drums. Because, you know, we live in the time where now most producers don't really use drums no more. And, you know, Griselda, they kind of brought that style in the mix. And it's cool, though. I like the vibe to it. But, damn it, we got to have our drums, man. Because that, that brings the knock in. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, like, I love drumless joints, too. But... Yeah. It really just depends, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, they got their time and their place. I try not to have too many on the project, for sure. There might be two or three on there, but um, it's definitely, like, uh, majority drums. And I, and I can't I can't resist a, a, dope, a dope joint with uh, knocking drums on it. I would probably say, like, the drumless joints probably came from Rock Marciano even before uh, Griselda. But um, it's definitely a trend, bro. You know, what I mean, you got a lot of producers that's trying to uh, jump on the, the drumless wave, and there's a lot of cats that do it dope, and you know, maybe not so, some not so much. But you know, you got people like Nicholas Craven. You know, he's like probably one of the, the main people like that's known for doing loops. You know, and like people like Klepto Beats, or you know, uh, like those are producers that pretty much are known for doing loops. You know what I'm saying? But um. I love my drums, though, bro. Ain't, ain't, nothing, ain't, nothing, ain't nothing harder than a, uh, a dope-ass drum track, man. Drum breaks, you know? Exactly. And talking about the album, 12 tracks deep. I could tell from listening to some of the tracks up there, you really put your foot in it. 
You know what I mean? What, what inspired the, the 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 album title? Um, I just wanted to like I always I like doing concept joints, you know. So um, I, I, I'm trying to think uh, how I thought about it, man. I think I was just like looking up, um, just doing research on di- on different like meanings of like different words for like uh, empty and things like that because I wanted to do a, like an album like um, around that type of concept. I just didn't know what I wanted to call it. You know what I'm saying? Like because there was some some stuff that was happening, some things I was going through at the time because I was making this album for a minute, probably like a year, and at the time like. There was just some things going on I wanted to touch on, but I didn't know how I wanted to title it. But I came across that title, and it just fit perfect, man. You know what I mean? Like, I like to pick titles where I could I could do some dope art behind it, all the music can be themed behind it, and it can, like, all kind of play out like a movie. You know what I mean? So the title's real important in that sense, man. Yes, sir. And that's also very important because it brings your – Life story to life. Like, you know, I like to say cinema on wax. Mm-hmm. No doubt. I agree with that. That's exactly what it is. Especially with my name being substance, man. You know what I mean? I take it seriously. So I'm probably more uh, transparent than most when it comes to that, putting my life on wax, as you say. And for- and for those who was come, who do, for those who just listening, I tell you, how, tell us how you all came up with the name. Um, man, I just um, I used to go by the name Technique at first. It was T E K N E E K, and that was like that was a minute ago. It's probably like two thousand and four or five, and then I shortened it to Tech. And then I had to change from that, you know, because uh, you got Smith and Wesson, right? Smith and Wesson, who's uh, Tech and Steel. So I had to change from that. So I had to pick a name at that time. And this was probably like 2007, 2008, somewhere like that. So that's when I picked Substance. And I just always liked one-word names that was real descriptive of, like, my style and, like, what I wanted to portray to the world. So, like, I picked Substance because of that. Because that's like what I wanted my music to be full of, you know what I'm saying? And the 810, that got added on later, probably like a couple of years after I changed the substance, because uh, it made it easier to search in the streaming platforms and everything like that, you know what I'm saying? Plus, it's plus the 810 is a, uh, obviously it's a it's a it's not it's not obvious to everybody, but it's a it's an homage to my hometown, Port Huron. That's the uh, that's the zip code back home, you know. That's what every phone number, the majority of the phone numbers start with back home is eight one zero. So that's also that too. And telling and telling us about Detroit, man. What was it like coming up at your era at that time period? Because you know we, there was a basically different now. I mean, even though street politics is the same, and you know it's grimy feel everywhere, but. It's just a different energy from the eras we came up with versus the era now. So do you care to tell, talk to us about what was it like in that old Detroit era coming up? I mean, you know, um, I grew up in Port Huron. Port Huron is about an hour away from Detroit. Um, but we was in Detroit all the time. You know what I mean? Old Detroit was a lot rougher, I would say than the new Detroit is, but, I mean, it still ain't sweet even now in, in the modern day. But um, I didn't grow up there every day and live there every day, so I couldn't tell you 100%. But it's definitely, uh, it was a lot different back in the day than it is now. You know what I'm saying? Like, even just going there, you know what I mean, living outside of it. Um, rough is probably the, the, the best way that I could describe it. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh I know one thing that stick out, like they were remodeling and gentrifying and stuff. A lot of a lot, uh, a lot of stuff downtown, like they are a lot of places, right? So there's uh, buildings that got green lights. You know, I guess those are more patrolled by police or whatever the case may be. Those are safer businesses to go to. And so, like that's not 
nothing that you would have seen back in the day. You know what I mean? There wouldn't have been no green lights to show you where what's safer or what not, you know? So that's a big difference. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. Um when you talk about yeah. gentrification definitely when you talk about gentrification, um, because this happened all over, not only in your city, but you know, in uh LA, you know, where Nipsey, you know, was from, you know, I've heard out in Crenshaw, you know, that they've been doing that. You know, parts of L.A., New York, you know, with Brooklyn, you know, all that. They've been gentrifying everything, you know, kind of changing it up. Uh, what's your feelings about how that divide, well, how that development comes in terms of what they're trying to institute as opposed to what was already there? I mean, it's 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 unfortunate to me in the sense of, like, it's almost an ironic thing because, like, a lot of things are going to get fixed and beautified, quote unquote, you know, and uh, remodeled. But um, none of the people that live there the whole time are going to reap the benefits of it, like, in the sense of being able to enjoy it. Because a lot of times, you know, the rent and uh, the cost of living gets pushed so high that, that those people got to leave. You know what I'm saying? And then you yeah. got new faces coming in. That uh, that that didn't live there previously because you know, and they they're able to live there now because they can afford it, and it's just a real ironic thing, man. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of sad, you know. Um, I wish the places I wish places could get fixed up and uplifted without that happening. You know what I mean? Like I I think anybody can, should be able to live where they where they want to live. You know what I'm saying? But it shouldn't be like. Uh, only certain people can live there because now that you've done all this, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're the only people that can afford to. Like, that's just fucking, that's asinine, you know? That made no sense. Yeah, it's crazy because when I used to teach, uh, I was teaching in the hood and um, it was a project, you know, and over, you know, this is going back to like 99, 2000. And then, you know, a lot of those people in the hood, you know, got word that, they were going to start demolishing those houses and they were going to start building, you know, like homes. And, you know, the, the, the common lament, you know, the outcry was that, you know, where are we going to go? Because it's like this is not public housing under a government subsidi- subsidiary anymore. This is going to be private homes purchased where the money is obviously, as you said, exponentially higher than what it was previously. So um, that's always been a thing of, you know, like you said, it's n- it's, it just doesn't sit well, I think, you know, I think with yourself, myself, King, and a lot of people where you just kind of push people out, um, you know, and it's like, where are they going to go? It's like you made room for everybody else who's more financially affluent, who is more upwardly mobile, but those who are less fortunate and of a lower social strata and finance, you know, what happens to them in all of it? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they get displaced. And it's really unfortunate, you know. It's really unfortunate. It's crazy, though. Sign of the times. I mean, pretty much throughout your growing up, man. You, you know, you speak on, you know, being in the, you know, in the city. You know, uh, how did that really influence your art in terms of really taking everything you saw and articulating it into your craft and still composing consummate classics to this day? you know, from that inspiration? Oh, man, to be honest with you, man, I I, I mean, um, this might be surprising, but I feel like my music got better the, the more that I went outside of, of uh, my state. You know what I mean? Um, when I lived outside in different states and when I traveled, the more that I traveled, I feel like um, it was easier to be more creative you know what I'm saying? I had more things to talk about, you know. Um, I can only talk about so much being at home, you know what I mean? Like, when you get out and you see things, man, I think that helps expand the music even more. You know what I mean? Like, broaden your horizons, as they say. And not only from your music perspective, uh how what would you how important do you think it is just in general for people you know of the world from all over to be able to be panoramic in their you know uh in their travels and being able to go other places other states other countries you know just seeing something different 
from what they were accustomed to, letting people know that there are, there is, you know, something more universal, something more, you know, uh, you know, broad, how in that scope. I think it's very important, man. You know, um, I remember moving to Arizona. It was one of the first times I moved out of state. Uh, it was just eye opening, man. Um, when you live somewhere, one place for so long, I think even without even knowing it, you begin to uh, subconsciously believe like that every everywhere is like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then when you go to another place and you, and you see how different things are in positive ways, you, you'd be surprised. You know what I'm saying? Like, and um, it's just like really motive. It's really motivating, man. You know what I'm saying? Like to see how much better it can be outside of where you grew up. I mean, you, you probably find, I know I found myself wishing I would have moved away or, or ventured off and, and traveled, like, much sooner, you know what I'm saying? Like, every time I leave, I, I think I got to go do it more, you know what I mean? Always got to come back home, of course. This is home, mm-hmm. but every time I leave, I think, man, I got to go experience some things more, you know? It's a very important thing to do. Now, yeah. now, you know, we, we got, you guys are talking about traveling to different places and, you know, experiencing different sceneries. Now, when you were in album mode or you record an album mode and you recorded certain songs, did that ref- scenery reflect on the songs that you're making? Yeah, for sure. You know, um, I remember just a couple, it was maybe a month ago or so, I started some verse off, said something about, I wrote this in a Venice lot, and I actually, and like, I did, but it was like a couple months previous, I think I, I think I started a verse when I was in California, I was about to leave, usually when I'm about to leave, I, I go to, I go to Venice Beach, that's my favorite place to go, I'll just go chill before I go to the airport, because it's right there by the airport, I'll go there mm-hmm. and chill, kick it for my last, for my last time there. And I always end up cooling out and writing something, you know, or whatever. So I started this verse there, and then uh, I hopped on my man's song. Um, I can't even remember what song it is off the top of my head right now. I'll be doing so many joints, man, but not even on the... But uh, I started to join off like that. Like, I wrote this I wrote this verse in the Venice lot, and, like, that's just a real-life thing. Like, I, I actually did two months prior to that. And it's just dope being able to say certain things that are actually real in the music, you know what I mean? Like, things that you've seen, things that you've done, and not, like, um, artificial things, or, or not, not or superficial, I should say. You know what I'm saying? Like, real authentic things, real experiences. It's dope to be able to talk about that stuff. Yeah, and, and I think from that end of this, uh, you know, what you when you speak about it, because one thing about it is when you think about when you write, it's a time capsule from that particular period of time. So you're writing it from where you're at in the moment, which I think gives it more panache. It gives it more of that, uh, you know, added, like mm-hmm. you said, authenticity, that genuine uh, feeling to it. In an age where we see a lot of rappers, um, um, you know, try to, because there is a differentiation between rappers and MC, and you are most definitely an MC in every sense of the word. Thank you. What do you feel today about how a lot of rappers are embellishing or exaggerating or, fuck it, outright lying about, you know, <laughs> their experiences and everything and their compositions are more counterfeit than creatively factual? I mean, um, to be honest with you, I think it's more like the opposite nowadays. Like, I was talking to my OG maybe a couple of weeks ago. Shout out to my OG, man. And um, he was like, you know, he was frustrated. He was like, man, they, these dudes saying too much. they sharing too much. He said he riding down the highway with this, and he got it stashed here, and they doing this this amount of mileage and all this, he's too descriptive. You know, he's giving away too much game. And I was like, man, you know, I guess OG got a good point. Like, you know, especially because from his from his point of view. But I would say, I say that to say this. Like, I think people, it's more of an era where, like, everybody is really saying what they're doing. 
there's probably still some people lying, but I think the majority of people is really saying what they're doing, and some people is even going overboard and saying too much. You know what I'm saying? Like, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and King and myself, we, we talk about it so much because we see there's an emphasis now. We talk about on social media how we see these things, people really trying to act like they outside, like they were the biggest goon on the block, like they was a bully with all the bullets busting off shots and a lot. Um, and a lot of times there, we've learned this from experience your reputation precedes you by like by authentic actions or perceived, you know, actions, what people think of you or what you've actually done. And either way, you're going to ultimately have to answer for it, you know, um, which we see a lot of artists deliberately put themselves out there to make themselves look like, you know, they untouchable, this, that, and the other. And we've, we've always felt like this. If you are who you say you are, there is no explanation needed about your exploits because you know what you did and the people around you know what you've done. So that's proof in itself. Yep. But once you yep. start getting out there trying to portray a reputation and put yourself in that place, a lot of times everybody postures like, you know, it's, they're, they're, they're dangerous, but they don't understand how perilous that is because you're going to get tested. And depending on the levels of that test, that's something you might fail and flatline from in more ways than one. Yeah, man, and it's hard. It's hard to keep coming with that too. You know, how do you top that? You got to keep going, getting more grandeur with it every time. You know what I'm saying? Got to get more outlandish every time. When you're talking about yourself, you're being true to yourself. You're talking about your life. That's something that never ends. You know what I'm saying? And you don't have to. You just you can just be true to yourself, and that's and you can you can be dope and clever with that. I think people can relate to that more. You know what I mean? Like. There's definitely something dope about every style of rap, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and why people relate to it. Sometimes it's because it touches them, and and they actually been through it or they feel that way. Or sometimes it's something that they wish they could do, you know, but they they never could in life. So they're intrigued uh-huh. by it, you know. So you know what I mean? Like, there's different reasons, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And- yeah, and I think that's something that has to uh, really resonate, you know, with a listening audience, you know, because it's about what you get out of it and what people put into it. Um, because a lot of times, I don't think anybody really, really in their right mind wants to put themselves in danger, but they want to make themselves out to be dangerous. Um, right. you know, a lot of times when we see people yeah, put you themselves... Attention. Exactly. Thank you, Ken. Exactly. Exactly. And see, you know, when we look mm-hmm. at uh, I know I know we beat this dead horse a million times. We look at the situation with Takashi, who's talking about how he's broke now, this, that, and the other. You know, but he was a modern day, you know, court jester of courting danger. You know, uh, once again, shameless plug for right. Sean Sotero. You know, uh, Takashi Six Nine story, the book he's written, it is excellent. If you all have not gotten it, go out and get it. He details the whole story, and when I was reading the book. Um, he just broke down how Takashi got around, you know, shoddy, new, you know, new car of all those guys and who were real goons in the street. And, you know, it was a trade off. They wanted the, you know, money and he wanted the respect and notoriety of being around, you know, real goons. But at the end, look how it turned out for him. Right. Right. It's a perfect example, of, you know, like, um, it's, it's, I mean, like, there's there's no uh, good road at the end of it. It's really ironic and, sh- and like, or, uh, really ironic in the end how it works out. And uh, nobody in the in the in the culture like is gonna feel sorry for the guy now, right? You know, I mean, uh, uh, it's not even a sad ending. It's just it's just ironic. Leave it at that. <laughs> uh, especially when, yeah. uh, especially when them record sales slow up and you ain't getting no tour dates. That. After a while, right. the cloud ain't the clock can't work no more. When I mean, that was about to happen. Your anyway, ass for you know, shows. He's on, he's on that one hit, on, on that on that uh, on that wave, fifteen minutes of fame type wave. Anyway, but when you put that other stuff in the mix, even more volatile, you know. Yeah, because at the end of the day, 
it got to be a mixture of humility and a mixture of talent as well to get people far. Sure, I agree. You gotta, you gotta be make timeless music and like be a, a timeless type of person too. You know what I mean? You can't be like a flash in the pan type of personality. You know what I mean? You gotta be able to stay, stay with the stand with the with the times, go through the ages, adjust. A lot of cats just here for a moment, man. Now. When we talk about those, when we talk about who's here for a moment and who's, you know, eternal, uh, we just celebrated the passing, you know, a couple of years ago. Well, his birthday, rather, you know, the late great Sean Price. Obviously, absolutely he worked with him. Um, One of the greatest. You know, he, yes, I mean, he, he was. He would have been fifty, you know, this year. When you think about working with him. The level of influence he had And you know how it inspires you To keep going in music Um Give us your thoughts I actually I haven't worked with him I wish I did I wish I did Yeah rest in peace to the guy Sean Price I wish I did Yeah he was uh, uh, His his, his influence was (sighs) You know, he, he, he's right up there with, I mean, him, Rock Marcy, cats like that as far as underground rap. Like, they're the godfathers of this. Like, they're the reason why underground rap is a thing. And, you know what I mean? Why a lot of cats is even, why this why this whole renaissance and this culture is even a, even a thing as far as underground rap is concerned, in my opinion. You know what I mean? I don't think there ain't a lot of people that wouldn't say that. And then you throw Griselda in the mix, obviously. And then the rest is just history. Like, you got this whole underground renaissance type thing that everybody's talking about. It's a beautiful definitely thing. A perfect, definitely a perfect segment. And that was, dope. Once yeah, again, that was dope about P. And, yeah. And that was what was dope about P was he wasn't trying to be no, the hardest nigga. He wasn't trying to be, he ain't had no image. He was just being himself. He just happened to be fly with the way he spit. And he, right. he knew how to be grimy while really being grimy. He knew how to really balance it. Like we always knew he, he, he was out for a while too. Help, what, what and generations and generations. Mm-hmm. He was dope for a long time. That's what cats don't realize, you know. His image changed or whatnot, but he was dope for a very long time, you know. Yeah, yeah. You because know, when we think people about were it. paying attention yeah. to rock. They were paying more attention to rock because he rock had that voice. That instinctive voice, mm-hmm. you know. But when he became Sean mm-hmm. Price, he was, he became his own man. Yep, I agree. Definitely, I agree. And that is no because, and definitely got to just know because I definitely didn't want to get that uh, flubbed in terms of you know asking about previous work with him, of which you said you did not. But when you think about it in terms of, so my apologies on that. When you think about it, like you like you were saying, in terms of how he got on later, in terms of people really recognizing his talent, how important is it for us as a culture to recognize the legends while they are here and appreciate from their beginning of their career to when you know through the present day to when we may not know that they may not be with us to share their gift? Now, I think that's really important, you know. It's really unfortunate when um, you know, rap legends die, when MCs die, and everybody says how much they love the man and all that. You know what I mean? Like, like I remember somebody. Um, this is like an opposite example of that. But somebody was like, "Oh, I wish everybody." Um, when when DMX passed, I seen somebody comment and they was like, "I wish everybody would say how much they loved DMX when he was alive." And somebody commented like. Well, actually, everybody did. You know what I mean? Like, that was one of the rare cases where I feel like he really got his flowers and, like, really got his love and his respect his whole life up until when he passed. You know what I'm saying? As far as DMX is concerned. And I wish everybody in the culture was treated like him. You know what I'm saying? Like, or even better and more so. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, when we think about it, when we look at guys like Tupac, you know, who we love and respect dearly as an artist, you know, as a cultural icon. Um, 
me and King have talked about this off air. The one thing that kind of irks me with a lot of people is that it just it's it's like they treat it like it's fashionable to like him and as opposed to really understanding who he was and what he represented and how great his music was. And this is not directed at the true fans who really appreciated him and keep his legacy alive. I just have an issue in general where we have these fad fans that jump on a wave just because it's popular, but not because they're genuinely attuned to the art that the artist expresses. Um, when we look at artists like Raskas with the phenomenal release of Soul on Ice in 1996, one of the greatest hip-hop albums ever, you know, I mean, a lot of his guys were didn't appreciate it because they said the beats weren't hot. But like Raz said, the beats were not the point. It was about the lyrics and him, you know, telling, you know, just, just spitting rhymes. And I think sometimes people get caught up in the hysteria, the, uh, the popularity contest, but not really understanding the creative energy, the imagination the tenacity, the determination, what goes into putting out, you know, timeless classic products, you know? Yeah, man, there's, there's different, just like there's different levels of like, you know how you said there's a rapper and there's an MC, and then there's even different levels of rappers and different levels of MCs as far as skills. I think that's the same way with like listeners, you know what I'm saying? Like there's different levels of listeners. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, you got, like, aficionados and, like, connoisseurs who, like, are going to listen to it like that and break it down and really analyze it. But then you got casual listeners, you know what I mean? And you got, like, bandwagon listeners even below them. You know, so, I mean, there's levels to it. I like that breakdown. I like that breakdown. I like that breakdown. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, me and my homie was talking about that. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. that all plays a part in in everything of how somebody consumes the music, how they digest it, you know, because you got a lot of cats who quote unquote review music and give one out of 10 scores, you know, on, on albums. And I'm not even knocking it because there's, there's a few cats that I, that I rock with, you know what I mean? Um, like shout out to CAT reviews, right? And like food sick, you know, uh, those are a couple of dope cats on IG, but um, there's some cats who like do it for, controversy and there's some cats that you could tell right. they just casual right. listening and just and just floating through it and just just looking to, to to just like barely digest it and throw something out there just to have the, the article up or whatnot you know so there's different levels yeah. to it most definitely i mean we look at artists like mf doom i mean mf doom you know people are all of a sudden listening to mf doom and like oh my god this guy is the i'm like Nigga, we've been knowing about MF Doom for over twenty years. Nah, they, <laughs> nah, they be 30. doing that. Right. Nah, they be doing that with Dilla. They be, especially with Jay Dilla. They be doing that a lot. Yeah, like, I be man. seeing a lot of these Speak hipsters. On Speak on the hipsters it. coming up there with the damn oh Jill Dilla's the goat. I'm like, you can't even name me three beats. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let alone three albums. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know. I be yeah, yeah, seeing these yeah, hipsters with the, with the sure. Jay Dilla donut shirt, and I be like. I appreciate terrible. You gotta know what you're wearing first. Just like I be seeing some of these cats wearing rock shirts, and you ain't know five songs from Metallica. Like you gotta know what you're wearing. Unfortunately, everything is hype today, man. You know, unfortunately, I guess it's it's all cool at the end of the day. Like 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 in Jay Dilla case, as long as Mom Dukes ah. is getting the love, it's, it's all good. You know. You'll see Mom do call some shit out. She'll she'll call it out quick. Absolutely. Now, if the, now I like that. I love if, it. If, if that if them resources now if them resources is going to Mom Dukes, then hey, it's good. But if it's going it's to cool. the t-shirt nigga in the back selling that, nah, <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> it's a different ball it's not game. A good look. Right. Absolutely. Like, 100%. Get, like at least get it from the source. At least get it from the source, and you can mm-hmm. get an understanding because that's that's what we got to do. Also, we got to teach the people that don't understand the legacy. That's 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 our part. I just don't like the arrogant ones that think they know it all. They try to tell us. 
it's a lot of cats that don't care about the history and the culture or whatnot. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. We in 2022, man. Like, time going by. We in the future. We way past the future in, in the movie Back to the Future. You know what I'm saying? Like, we we, we in some crazy times right now. <laughs> Perfect, perfect segue, yeah, perfect segue, sub, perfect segue, sub, because in terms of crazy times, because while we were talking about the backpack cult, we were talking about the underground culture and everything, Kanye's latest documentary, mm-hmm. we all know what's been going on in terms of his recent actions, but the situation about how the backpack, the underground hip hop scene at times gets exploited for personal gain, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, when you have, have you seen the documentary yet? Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Okay, yeah, I seen okay. it. Okay, sure. I, I want, That's I want, interesting. Yeah. I want, okay, it's interesting well, you to have. me. Yeah. Please give, mm-hmm. please give mm-hmm. us your uh, opinions on. And I know King has his rivalry with Talib, but on principle, <laughs> me and my brother, we talked about it. But, <laughs> but King, we won't get into that on the show. But with King, but King was no. about. But King was like he didn't feel. Kanye really gave most Def and Talib the props that he should have for how they helped him along with the underground audience, helping him boost his, you know, profile when pretty much at the time nobody thought he would be anything. Um when you when and it's funny how Red Man said this on you know, basically, you know yeah, I've seen uh that. You know, yeah, on that on that uh, on that trap, basically, you know, what I'm saying, um, you know, and and he said, and you know, and why is it, you know, rappers always be using the hard, you know, the underground, you know, to make a comeback? Is it fair to the hardcore niggas that rap who don't give a fuck about the radio <laughs> or the next bitch at that? <laughs> right, right, right. You know, what I'm saying, uh, please give us your thoughts on that stuff. Man, I mean, and that was um, of course, yeah, that was of course off there. So if, if, if I'm not mistaken, didn't, yeah, didn't he say that? Yeah, that was that, that was wrong. Yeah. Didn't he say? Yeah. Didn't he say in the documentary that he was? Um, remember that part in the documentary? He was like, "Oh, I was just acting like a backpacker." Right. Right. Remember right, that part? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that part yeah. shocked me, bro, because because I never knew that. You know what I mean? Like I remember. When um when when like those albums came out, I remember what grade I was in, where I was at in life. I remember hearing them and thinking like this shit is authentic. This is some real hip hop shit. And when he right. said that he was acting like like a backpacker and just using the backpack culture and all of that, like they had showed the stuff with Pharrell here and through the wire already and all that. I was like, I'm thinking to myself, you you was acting like. It, it kind of it kind of like threw me off, bro. You know what I mean? And um, I definitely don't think he gave like uh, I don't know when when you get when you get into like Talib and Most Def enough love, or did he did he did he show him love back like they did him? That's really a, a hard thing to say because perception is like crazy from one person to another. But I will say, like, I, I haven't heard a lot of joints. You know what I'm saying? I haven't heard them do a lot of songs and collaborations and just haven't seen them be together since. You know what I mean? Like, and, and that's strange to see now that you see the documentary and how they put on for them. You know what I mean? How they vouched for them, brought them out on stage or whatnot. It's mm-hmm. crazy, man. It's real eye-opening. You know what I mean? The majority of the documentary is is, is, is inspirational. But those parts like that, right. it's very eye opening for sure. Yeah, yeah, because and, um, you know when you're looking at a, when you're looking at a documentary, you're you're basing how you relate the music with a person's character, and, if, mm-hmm. and you're trying to identify with their struggle. So, right to identify with the struggle, you find total inspiration, and that part was like you said was an eye opener because it's like, damn, you shit on the dudes that helped you. You know what I mean? Like, and then we was like, well, how much of this do we believe of your life now? Like, that was the part that he shut up to for me when he was when he was like, I was acting. When he said I was acting and I was and, and all that and I was using the backpack, 
I was like mind blown. I was like, whoa. Because I never thought that was the case. I thought he always loved hip hop and that was his roots. And then he just chose to expand from there. You know what I'm saying? And evolve. You know what I mean? I didn't know that that's how he looked at it. Like, like he just used that as a conduit and a route to get on real quick. Stepping stone or whatnot. That was crazy to me, man. Yeah, and it's definitely something where we look at the game and we see how people will do what they got to do to get on. Um, and it's still, even if it's not Kanye, if people choose other avenues, what's your feelings about how people will take the approaches to get on? Yeah, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Uh, what? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. You still on? Uh, T Max, ask the question again. Thing? Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Woke up. I got. Hold tight. I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear the last part of what you said. Yeah, he had a uh, connection issue for a minute, man. But you know, when he gets back, I want to ask you about this question here now. What really caught me too was another one of your covers was when you used the cover from the movie Fresh. Dope fucking movie. One ah, of the best okay. movies from the nineties, man. Bro, that's my favorite movie, bro. That's one of my that's like my top five movies. I'll share some I'll share in. something crazy with in. you. You can hear yeah, me yeah, right yeah. now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll share something crazy with you though. Um that's definitely one of my top five movies. I made that cover too. For sure. I made a Word. few of my covers, but that's one of the covers that I made, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And what, why was that movie That's so dope. significant to you? What 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 really what made it so significant to you in terms of being one of your favorites? Man, I mean, shout out to my dude Chuck Chan because he produced that whole album just like he did Desolate Lands. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That was the first album me and me and him did together, right? In 2020. But um that 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 movie there's a lot of there's a, it's based off chess and that whole album was based off chess and chess was something I picked up just uh at, at some at some hard times in my life and and chess took me to some to some better places you know what I'm saying like and um chess is one of those things like that can teach you discipline and and, and other things you know what I'm saying kind of like martial arts right you know my my, my father does martial arts. So that movie was like special to me in that way, you know what I'm saying? And there's, and there's other things about that movie that are special too. But that's just that's just an ill movie, man. I love that movie. So to do something based around that movie and chess in the same in the same thing was was really dope. Man, I heard one thing about chess. They said, do not play that game unless you have total control of yourself <laughs> because the <laughs> strategy of it inherently, you're grinning, so because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because chess, yeah, you know, yeah. teaches you to be inherently paranoid in terms of anticipating moves. You know, I actually watched yeah. years ago the uh, the um, HBO special, you know, in search of Robbie, F- you know, Bobby Fisher. And, you know, Bobby yep. Fischer, of course, was a chess mastermind, arguably the greatest player ever, but ultimately um, he consumed himself so much with it. I mean, imagine being by the time you're 21, 22 years old, you're the grand chess master of the world. You're the greatest player ever. And um, But the problem was that? the greatest team was. Exactly, and that's what his mother said. Congratulations. What are you going to do for the rest of your life? And right. It's just it's a great documentary for those for our audience out there. If you have not seen it, check it out. It's 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 a dope ass documentary um, of the genius, the madness, you know, that simultaneously coexisted and where one pot, you know, then it's the chicken or the egg. Which one mm-hmm. begat the other? Was he already mad? Did pre begot the genius, or was he a genius that eventually was driven mad by his genius? You know. Right. Right. It's it's a crazy thing to figure out. It's definitely a dope documentary, though. That's that's a good thing to watch too, as well. Definitely. So when you think about yeah, what the, game the other top movies that you have on the list? What was that? What was the other uh, top movies you had on the list? Oh man, in the top five. Top five. 
Fresh is definitely in there, man. Top five. Mm. Off the top of my, I'm gonna just go off the top of my head, dog. I would have to say, I'd have to say, Boys in the Hood, Men of the Society, Paid in Full. Mm. That's three, man. I already said Fresh was Fresh. Fresh would be five, so. Four, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a hard one to pick, man. For four, I probably say like uh, I gotta pick like a gangster movie. I'm not gonna pick one that's some some once once upon a time in America. That's that's, that's a really dude. Uh, you read really my mind. You read either my that, mind. Either that or um, either that or uh, is it once upon a time in Brooklyn? No, sorry, the one where uh, Colosio no. I can't remember, but uh, probably Bronx once upon Tale. a time in America. Yeah, I, I, yeah, Bronx Tale. It was Bronx Tale. Yeah, those are inter- yeah. Once upon a time in America and Bronx Tale would be interchangeable for number four. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> wow. Off the top, man. Of, look, yeah. Look for those yeah. that have not seen Once Upon a Time in America. That's a long ass movie, but God knows it is worth the long watch. You gotta take a whole <laughs> day. <laughs> you gotta take a whole day, man. Start that in the morning, you know, and like maybe take some breaks. But I mean, with Ennio Morricone, I mean, with Kaka's theme, I mean, musically, what he did in terms of production, because he scored the movie, rest in peace, to one of the greatest composers ever. I mean, that was, I mean, Ecstasy of Gold, you know, of course, it was used in Jay Z's Blueprint 2. I think it was off the good band, the ugly originally. I mean, but that guy, I mean, but that. Oh man, I mean, crazy. <laughs> who that movie? I, I I'm speechless because I just can't say enough great things about how much of an epic masterpiece that movie was. Um, I, I want to say it's about three it's hours, right? Yeah. Like it's 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 about the same length as Malcolm X, right? right. Yeah, and I want to say actually uh, Malcolm X is about three hours. I want to say uh, once it's about time of America was like damn near like four and a half five hours long. Oh, I want to wow. say if you wow. actually, yeah, if you actually, if you're looking at the unedited version of it. Um, okay, that's what it is, right? But it's yeah, that's yeah but I remember. It's worth it though. Uh, yeah, but I remember watching it's that for the first though. time in 2004. Um, uh, it was it was a long night. That's all I'm gonna say, and <laughs> not in the best way. You you can definitely but, uh, watch Bronx Tale in its place and, and, and still get a great movie. Just just the same. I'll say that. Definitely. Now when you think about the cinematography and the uh subject matter and just the acting, mm-hmm. what to you defines a movie that is not only a classic but genre defined that really is an exemplary example of what the genre is supposed to represent? Like you mentioned, Boys in the Hood. You mentioned Minister Society. You mentioned Once Upon a Time in America. What to you makes a movie complete that defines it of what it's trying to express? Man, I think um, when somebody captures the feeling and the mood of um, of like that era, like uh, Spike Lee would do that really well, right? Something like Do the Right Thing. You know what I'm saying? That would be that to me. Yeah, um, you know, because we on a movie tangent now, so we're gonna we're gonna rock with this for a minute. I think with Boys in the Hood, it was resonated so much because you're you know it's like you're dealing with Trey growing up in right? South Central. You know, he and it's a movie, mm-hmm. it's a coming of age about growing up in an environment that is very unforgiving, and you know you're forced to really see a lot of things growing up fast. I mean, like when a dude broke in to their house when he was young, you know, and Furious set off shots, you know, about when Trey, you know, uh, when he got roughed up by the police, you know, uh, when Ricky got killed. Right. I mean, when you, take it to, when you take it to Minister Society, when you see Kane, which mm-hmm. that, that movie to me is just, you're dealing with two movies from 1991 in 1993, respectively, they should have gotten Oscars for Best Original Screenplay and Acting. <clears throat> Cuba Gooding Jr., Ice Cube, Tyrone Turner, you know, Lorenzo, all classes. them in those movies. I mean, and to just see, and I think Minister Society resonated more uh, because you're seeing yeah, yeah. Uh, 
a dude by the name, and shout out to Watts, you know, because that's where the movie was based in. But you're seeing Kane basically be the typical, you know, straight up hood nigga who didn't give a fuck. But the transition of what he goes through throughout the movie, you're seeing the change come gradually. It was not convoluted. It was not just thrown together. You see events that kind of make him reevaluate his life. And then you see the right. gradual, and then when he meets his OG behind bars, you know, I mean, which was just a powerful scene where he's telling him, you know, take my girl, you know, and leave, you know, get out of the city. He's like, I know how y'all feel about each other. He's like, I can take care of my son. I can't do shit for him while I'm in here. I mean, that was like, whew. Powerful, bro. Mm. Powerful. But at the Beyond end of the day, powerful. yeah. But, you know, but Kane did a lot of shit during the movie. You know what I mean? Look, when he stuck up due to the burger joint, I was like, <laughs> that was like ratchet and funny at the same time. <laughs> but you know, I mean, after he got old girl pregnant, and you know, her cousin come up and they beat her yeah, cousin yeah, down. Yeah, and then, yeah, but I mean, right. the end, but the moral of the story was at the end, you know, with the Hughes brothers. Shout out to Albert and Allen there because the movie was not meant to have a happy ending. It was meant to show what you do and the perils of living that life. You Didn't know, they say Pop was supposed to play Kane? Didn't they say yeah, that? Yeah. He, yeah. Well, actually, he, he was supposed to play Sharif. He was, he was supposed to play Sharif. Sharif. Okay. And, That's what yeah. It was. I can only, okay. you know, speak on this, and we can only say this on the show because this is documented what happened. This is where Pop and the Hughes brothers had that, you know, altercation because Pop mm-hmm. didn't like the role. He felt like with Sharif, because Sharif was supposed to be a gangster slash Muslim, and Pop felt like that was too much of a contradiction, so he had an issue with the role. So him and the Hughes brothers had some words about it, and then that's when, you know, to hear witnesses say there was a fight between Pac and them, and, you know, Pac's yeah. entourage, and that's when he was kicked off the set. You know, he was kicked out of the movie because yeah. of it. And that's when Vontae mm-hmm. Sweet, you know, shout out to him, he got the role as Sharif. But, uh, I mean, that was just, who that was a pop. That movie just kind of dropped out of it nowhere. Was, I heard it like, now, I heard originally Spice was supposed to be been Kane. Possibly. Oh, wow. That, 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 that would have been. You know what? But I can't I, I can't picture nobody else being like, make me some grits or whatever the hell that nigga said when he, uh, when he answered the door for the, uh, for the white guy. MCA played the, uh, the best part. Yeah. But, yeah. but with t- Wax. Yeah. Yeah, wax. A <laughs> wax. Put some put some cheese on them grits or whatever the hell it whatever the hell he said, man. Okay, <laughs> Classic, man. Classic. But uh Yo, but Tyron Turner Tyron Turner, he immortalized that role as Kane. I mean, that was and to me it's criminal that he has never really gotten a recognition. I mean some would say he got pigeonholed behind that role, but I'm like and man, and you, you know well, how it goes in Hollywood. That was actually, I don't know. I think that was actually, uh, I, that might have been her first movie, but that wasn't her first foray in entertainment. Well, of course, she was on a different world, you know, in 1991. Yeah, I think it was her first movie, though, official, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, but that was her first, That's crazy yeah, to think you know, that, but that, That's crazy to think that dude, was her start because she went on to be... Like but, dude, think about, but think about, but y'all, think about how it was in Hollywood back in the day, especially black movies. You had a movie with Boys in the Hood that had Morris Chestnut, Neil Long, Lawrence Fishburne, Angela Bassett, Yo Yo, Regina King. You know, you have Minister Society with Glenn Plummer, Charles S. Dutton, Jada Pinkett, uh, MCA, you know, you know. Oh, you know, Lorenz Tate, you know, Tyrant Turner. I mean, you're looking – I mean, this was like – when you think about it, to see all of them come up at that time. I mean, when you got Jason's lyric, Jada Pinkin, Alan uh, Payne, Tretch, you know, Eddie Griffin, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's just that era, I don't think – I tell anybody. I tell any of the youth. That was today, a renaissance. That was a major renaissance era. You had to yeah. have been there, exactly, King. You had to have been there to really understand how dope that era was, and how special it was. That was um, like the golden era of movies. 
<laughs> yeah, but we but we were seeing everybody like we were seeing all these legendary stars who were really beginning to get their come up. You know, um, mm -hmm. this is a time where you know, you know, Black Hollywood was still developing in a sense. You know, so this is where we had the comedies, of course, Shout Out Coming to America, Hollywood Shuffle. You know, Harlem Nights, all those movies before that. But then we start getting to the 90s when we get movies like Fresh, you know, Boys, Menace, you know, um, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, um, and then, of course, dramas later on like Best Man and Have Plenty, you know, uh, Soul Food, of course, can't leave that out um, among many, you know, and we're, we're just, you know, we're just seeing that era change. You know, we're watching all of these stars, these legends who they become now, who are starting out. And it wasn't like these were just token performances. These were the performances that stand the test of over 30, 35 years. It's crazy you to know? think how many great movies came out during that time. It's really crazy to think that so many amazing yeah, the years. That inspires so much. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, it inspires Can't. so many tunes too. Like, the, the, especially the the movie scores. You know how many you know people what? sampled the thinking juice about thing? that. The soundtracks were. Well, what, what happened to soundtracks? You don't even hear about Dude. them anymore. <laughs> we got like, no good movies. movies. We, we forgot to look. We forgot to mention Juice and New Jack City. I mean, how can we forget those? I mean, Tupac when he like when he did Above Juice in 1992. Rim. How about that? That was one of the best soundtracks ever. Yes. Above the Rim was one Dude, of the best yeah. soundtracks ever in life. Yeah. That was crazy. And, you know, it's Earth funny. Black that and uh, Sunset Park. Sunset Park was a dope-ass soundtrack, too. Oh, That was yeah. a dope-ass movie Absolutely. as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but to see all, I mean, but it's, what is your opinion about how a, a, a soundtrack should accommodate a movie in terms of a company? Because those soundtracks, I mean, Above the Rim, I mean, Juice, Fresh, I mean, Menace of Society. I mean, those, like, were hard. <laughs> I think we don't have those type yeah. of movies no more to, to uh, you know, require those type of soundtracks. We don't even, they're, they're, those type of movies don't even exist no more. You know what I mean? Those movies was raw, man. Like, we don't have... Um, Sunset Parks and, and Clockers and New Jersey Drives and Crash. Can't forget and, Strapped. Can't forget Strapped either. Strapped, and, you know, like, you know, like Coach Carter. You know, we don't got movies like that now. So I think the movies used to dictate the soundtracks, and that's why those soundtracks used to be so classic, man. So much emotion because it was raw. <laughs> Yeah. And I think some of them, you said, I think some of the movies today, y'all, man, I, I think it's just some of the movies like, I, I mean, King, my brother, I don't think a movie like Minister Society could have got released today. <laughs> nah. Nah. It's, it's too commercial nowadays. It depends. Man. Like, they might have to, much they're going to do that. They're going to, it depends, though. I think if they release it on Netflix or they do it, probably, it'll probably go to Tubi. <laughs> uh -huh. I don't think it'll look this. I don't think it'll look the same. He wouldn't It'll be blowing cheaper. the guy's wig out in the store. Like, <laughs> I especially, remember when, especially when you first seen it back Koreans in the day, he was shot. They ain't going outlaw that. Right. They ain't definitely going outlaw that. Exactly. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, right. when you when you think about it, sub uh, being an artist. When you see the music has changed from the soundtrack to what it is now, and especially when we're living in a more uh, sensitive climate that is dictated by what is perceived as political correctness, how do you think that has changed the art? How do you think that has changed the distribution, the the marketing of, you know, not only hip-hop music, but music in general? Uh, as far as political correctness, I mean, it's way more censored now, you know. I would say that. Um, it's definitely like, it's, it's kind of like how, how comedy is, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I wouldn't say you got to watch what you say, but there's way more things that you could get, like, called out for or, or uh, red flagged on, per se, you know what I mean? Like, if you were to say them now, 
in a song or in music, you know what I mean, than back in the day. It's way more sensitive. Um, yo, y'all, did, uh, King, uh, sub, did y'all see that clip uh, from, this was a month ago, started making rounds. Like, this was, you know, and it was just, you know, just comedy. It was Martin Lawrence calling that girl out from Def Comedy Jam about how fine she was and everything. And no, uh, I didn't somebody, see that. If somebody wrote the comments, man, if he had said that today, they would have burned his ass. <laughs> it wasn't that don't even sound that bad, though. I don't I even know what it's also, about, think, but that don't sound bad. But I think what it is, though, I think, I think what happened is a lot of these rappers, not rappers, but entertainers today, they're more so concerned with corporate sponsorships. See, back then, we didn't, have no, we didn't care about corporate sponsorships. We didn't care. We just put the art out there and let them go for the dope. But see, when niggas sign up for them commercials and Sprite commercials and them yogurt ads and all that, and they're getting about a good five to ten million just to do endorsements. Because see, hip hop and you know entertainment period was an endorsement heavy back then versus today. Like the only nigga no, that's that we a good seen. Point. It's the only nigga we seen we doing commercials was Hammer and he got bashed. <laughs> he was doing chicken commercials. <laughs> Especially in Instagram these days, you know, like it's it's real easy to uh to be an influencer, you know what I mean, or be an ambassador of uh, a certain brands. You know what I mean? It's very easy. Way easier than, than back in the day, for sure. Yeah, and, and uh, it's just wild, man, because um, when you think about what we came up listening to, I think it just kind of, there, uh, and we we reminisce on it with so much nostalgia and the reverence of that nostalgia because it really was a coming of age for us. Um, as they say, when you think back on it, you can really appreciate it. But you don't really understand the significance because you're living in the moment. So it takes time after you're mm-hmm. out of that moment to really, really, really fully comprehend how it colored, you know, how it shaded, how it really outlined everything that would come after it. It was a template. It was the blueprint. It was the foundation, not in that order. Um, mm-hmm. Shows like Death Jam, it's, I mean, you know. Yeah. It was just like, you know, we saw a whole bunch of legendary comedians, you know, rest in peace, Bernie Mac. I mean, we saw Chris Tucker, you know, we saw Eddie Griffin, you know, we've seen all of these people before they really got out there, you know, yep. and, yep. you know, it, it, and, you know, this was comedy that really was about how we related to it from the hood as black people. And some of them jokes I know today, so some of those some people hear that, they're either going to say, either this shit is fucking brilliant or this shit needs to be fucking banned. <laughs> <laughs> you or, know. Either or. But it was edgy back. But it was edgy back then. And I think because we had never seen anything like that, you know, we had never seen a show that was centered or like that. They really allowed that type of unfiltered and uncensored uh, expression. And I think that's why Death Comedy Jam is so iconic today. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point for sure. I was thinking about that when I was watching like uh, backstage the other day, things like that, and like the show. You know how formative they were to me. Looking at those things, uh, watching those documentaries growing up, you don't realize it at the time, though. Like you said, you know. When you think about the culture and everything that's in it, how important is it for the generation today to really uh, understand what was, you know, the sound like in terms of the movies, the music, you know, even the shows, like, you know, Def Comedy Jam, even watching shows like A Different World, you know, uh, Sanford and Son, uh, you know, The Cosby Show, to really, really, really understand, you know, how those shows really impacted and I mean Martin you know of course uh, living single how how important is it for the youth to really go back in the genesis of that black entertainment during that time to really understand how far we came and how 
those stories defined us from different angles, like different world. It was a college, you know, when you're dealing with the Cosby show outside of the personal stuff Bill had going on, not to judge, you know, but I mean, this was about an upper, you know, this is about upper class, you know, black family. I mean, we're dealing with living single, you know, of course, with Queen Latifah, you know, having her own company, you know, there were different experiences that were expressed. How do you feel about that? I mean, I would say, like, um, if you haven't watched any of these, you're, you're definitely mi- missing out on a lot of bars, you know? <laughs> missing out on a lot of potential bars. No. But in, in, in all serious, no, um, seriousness, like, if, if you haven't watched these, man, it's like uh, back in the day, like, all of those shows, I think they used to be a more, um, you could watch them and, like, really know how it was back then. It's not like that now. You know what I mean? You watch shows nowadays and it doesn't represent like the society. Like it's 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 really just like whatever agenda that they're trying to push in that specific show. But back then you could watch those shows, man, and it it'd be like uh it's really like uh you could you could be like go back in a in a in a time machine back to that time. And you could really know what it was like back then. So I think it's um you're missing, you're missing out if you, if you don't know about a lot of them classics, man. You know what I'm saying? You can go back and get cultured, just just like you get cultured going to travel somewhere. You can go travel back in time and watch one of them shows. Yeah, and plus, on top of that, they're doing a lot of rebooting and remakes of a lot of the classics, and that kind of tells me that Hollywood is hey, gearing for a creative bankruptcy. Yeah, 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 that's true. I think that's uh, certain people are always trendsetters, you know, no matter what. So, but it's just becoming more apparent nowadays. I think that's what that is. <laughs> yeah, cause, yeah. Cause one thing I want to tell you guys that happened today, and they trolled, they trolled the hell out of me for this one here. That they was gonna come out with a Martin reboot, and this time they was gonna base it around Tommy and Pam love story. I was like, no, nah. I let y'all slide with the Bel Air shit, but no, nah, you ain't touching Marty Mar. <laughs> that's what I. That's what I was about to ask you. Did you like the Bel Air? That's what I was gonna be. I was gonna say that next. I even let that slide. But there's no nah, nah, I'm like, man, no, nah, I got <laughs> I let it I had to let that slide for it, man, because you know you had Will involved with it, you know. So you know, if he has his input, I was a little bit more comfortable with it. But don't right. touch Marty. He seemed like he was cool with it. Don't touch Marty Mom, damn it. Nah, Especially if it's based in your, in your in, it's based in your backyard, fam, because it's from Michigan. You know what I'm saying? We can't do that. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Leave that alone. Can't touch that. Leave that alone, man. Leave Martin alone. That's the goat black you know, sitcom. <clears throat> Don't leave that alone. Yeah, and you know, there's certain situations, y'all, uh, where there's just a certain. It's like with certain movies, certain television shows, certain albums. They can only be made at a certain time because of where the culture is. Uh, now, Bel Air is a little bit more on the serious, dramatic side than what it was in its first, you know, iteration, you know, because it was more of a comedy that had, of course, you know, at times serious stories. But this one is a little bit more serious at the core of it. Um, I mean, but when you think about it, black culture is something that is sacred because it is, while we have dealt with so much in this country, you know, in history, it's the one thing that we have that is, when done correctly and respectfully, is a genuine and respected and respectful representation of our struggle, our experiences, our highs, our right. lows, our joys, our pain. And they should be done with care by those that are real curators and caretakers of our culture. Because not everybody who looks like us is for us in terms of expressing that. It was like years ago, yes, and I'm going to go there. It's like when they were talking about they were going to do a Juice remake in Atlanta with Soldier Boy being the lead. And we was like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> Thank God it never <laughs> happened. 
you know, but that uh, was a rumor shit. they were going to do a remake. I'm like, that's a movie you can't redo. Shout out to Special Ed. We interviewed him last year. You know, you please can't remake a movie like that. <laughs> nah, please. Oh, no. Please don't. No way. No way. Something you just can't do, you know? Yeah, you know, it's just, it's like, as a matter of fact, we've been hearing them about, about them the trying to remake, we've been hearing them about to try to remake Scarface for 30 years. Dude, I heard they were going to close it I never see, heard stop about reading that. my mind. Stop reading my mind. <laughs> never heard about, about that, but can't do that either. Yeah, because Leonardo uh, DiCaprio was supposed to play, Leonardo DiCaprio what? was supposed to play the lead. Yeah. But they, they've on, had, this, 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 this has been going on for like the past seven years. You know what, I did, I did trying, hear that once. I yeah. Didn't hear that once. Now, now that you say that, he was supposed to play car- yeah. uh, Carface, right? Yeah. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, they've been the problem. But they've been having trying to bring Michael B. Script. Jordan. Yeah, but they've 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 had problems <laughs> trying to do the script in terms of how they're going to develop the script. I'm like, you can't redo that movie like that. <laughs> you know. Shit alone, man. <laughs> nah, man. <laughs> I'm like, let Al Pacino have his championship among many. Let right. Pacino have his championship right, with Tony Montana, man. And Pacino got a whole bunch of damn belts for best ever in a performance. I'm like, let him have that. Don't try to take that away from Al, man. Yo, they going to have to start. I don't, I, I'm like, yo, y'all going to have to start suing for plagiarism, man. man. Scorsese need to get on his, and Oliver Stone need to get on his job. Like, look, y'all, y'all can't come up remaking my shit. That's what he got to tell me. <laughs> Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like, you don't see nobody touching the boys in the hood. Nobody trying to touch that. Yeah, because we, we, don't, we don't play that. That's why. But you <laughs> couldn't do a boys in... You just couldn't do a boys in the hood today because for that era, 1991, it was... That was the first movie... Um, because there were, you could say, like, Cornbread, Earl, and me, uh, you know, the Warriors. Oh, yeah, that was a wow. you know, there was That was a classic. Yeah, you know, you know that are, mm. there were street oriented. But Boys in the Hood was mm. different because it really tackled it from not only from a, loca- from a locale perspective being in, you know, L.A., South Central, but the depiction of the story was just, Rest in peace to John Singleton because people forget he was 24 when he directed that. You wow. know, um, you know, uh, you know, he he graduated USC Film School, um, but to have that level of direction, to have the the feel, the touch, the understanding of what he wanted to portray in it, um. To really capture all of the characters and, you know, from a perspective of individuals, uh, it was just, it's a story I think, especially if you grew up in a hood in L.A., you could really, really relate to, um, you know, yeah, and that it. was the first movie, yeah, that was, I think that was the first movie that really tackled it from a street level like that, you know, uh, and it, it's still... <clears throat> you know, just like with Juice, you know, Juice would come after that, and it's basically mm. in New York, you know, set in New York, you know, and it's basically about four friends, but it's about that pursuit of that respect, and then, you know, uh, and how far will you, I think the tagline was, how far will you go to get it? Right. And I mean, Pac, I mean, Pac as Bishop was just, man. Nobody can play that role. You can't touch nobody playing that role. And he got that role not even trying to get it. (laughs) And he didn't. He wasn't even trying to get that role. And he y'all know the story behind that, right? Yeah, when he was he was playing around, right? Well, no. Well, actually, I think it was him and Tretch. They went to the reading, and I think Tretch read for it, I believe. so, you know, Pop just happened to be there. You know, the the producers, the director liked his look, so they just said, well, what the hell? We'll let him read, too. So they let him read for it. You know, so they give the stone face, like, you know, uh, 
you know, you know, like Hollywood do. They don't want to show their poker face. They said after we closed that door, we were like, <laughs> we're like, this <laughs> motherfucker needs to be in. Yeah, they were like, he needs to be in it. Wow. But I, but if I got the yeah, story, about think stretch could nobody so, playing like him. No, I mean, especially when they talking in that room and they had that dialogue when he talked about you got to let those motherfuckers know that you can take them out whenever you feel like it. <laughs> it's part to me when he cut when he caught him by the lockers in the hallway. Oh yeah, that's, that's the that's the illest part. So I don't give a fuck. Yeah, yeah, that was the coldest part right there. Yeah, Ain't nobody played that in my but, pop, uh, man, for sure. But, I mean, and that really began his movie legend, you know, in terms of it, because that was a mm-hmm. role that, you know, mm-hmm. while he wasn't the main star, you know, that was uh, Omar Reps because it was basically kind of centered around, you know, Q's character. Although, shout out to Jermaine Hopkins, you know, we had on a show a couple of years ago. Shout out Big Steel, you know, and, of course, you know, Khalil Kane, you know, uh, as well. But when you saw that, mm-hmm. man, I mean, but Pop, he just basically – he just took it to a whole nother level when you look at what he did in that film. Uh, I mean, that character of Bishop, he was just wow. And shout out to Sam Jackson because, you know, he was in it too. This is the time Sam Jackson was just popping up at every damn movie. <laughs> and then you're looking like, wait a minute, he was in that too? He was going to come to America. He was in uh, Jungle Fever. Then he was. Then he popped up in, in Juice. We were like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, true, true. Yeah. What do you see in terms of uh, how, in terms of black movies and black television shows now? Uh, so what do you feel about how they're, you know, what's how the black experience is being depicted now, today, from your perspective as an artist and as a fan? Man, I mean, um, I haven't had cable in so long, so... As far as the ones that I see, I would say, like, it's nothing like the Cosby show. You know what I mean? Like, that was, like, the uh, ultimate black family experience to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, in television. So, I, I don't I don't see anything like the Cosby show nowadays. You know what I'm saying? Or, or, or even anything like uh, hanging, with, hanging with Mr. Cooper. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, the watered-down version. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it, it's just not. I don't see a lot of uh, black family oriented shows like that nowadays. That's my opinion. Definitely. Um, if you could direct a movie, what would it be in terms of what would it be about and who would you have in it? Any genre? Yeah. Hmm. I would say uh, I would read. I'm, I'm gonna redo Belly. You know, I'm gonna redo Belly the right way because I didn't. I didn't like part two, so I'm gonna redo Belly the right way, and we're gonna have the original cast. So everybody that was in the original. And we're going to still let game be in it, but it's going to be a better movie. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Just like that. That was probably one of the most, that was probably one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> the worst. I have to go ahead and say ever. it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Man, look. Yeah. But when y'all, but we, but the funny thing is, is that with Belly 2, it had nothing to do with part one. But when you look at part nothing. one, what's Nothing. When you look at, but it's also, but the history of it, shout out to King Magazine years ago, they did a story on it, so they talked about what was going on with Belly from that perspective, and the thing was, uh, once again, movie trivia for y'all on office, so we cover everything, so what happened was that the movie initially, it ran out of money, that's why the ending was the way that it was, it was so kind of thrown together, <laughs> oh, because, shit. You know, yeah, they ran out of money during <laughs> filming. Shout out to the late great Louis Rankin as our good friend and legendary <laughs> dance hall legend. You know he was in it, of course. We miss him dearly. But yeah, the movie, uh, the movie ran out of money, 
and that's why they had to tie it up the way that they did. You he know, in was terms in there. Oh, that's the only thing that yeah. vaguely saved it. Damn. I forgot he was in there. It needed to be over at five. It needed to be a five-minute movie tops. <laughs> five yeah, but... Minutes. Yeah, but with Belly though, I mean, but that was why the uh, but they ran out of money with the uh, with the first one, and that's why it was so convoluted at the end. Like all of a sudden, you see DMX, you know, Tommy, he's now this born Muslim, but now he's supposed to assassinate uh, a, le- a black leader, and we were like, well, okay, what, what's going on with all? Like, where's the stuff behind all this? You know, but yeah, that's but they, they had to they had to tie it up because wow. they ran out of money at the time, and that's why they had to. I mean, the movie did great. Uh, and once again, speaking of soundtracks, boy, that Belly soundtrack was bananas. <laughs> boy, that trailer that was good. Awesome, and I and I can hear and I can hear a primo beat. I know a primo beat a thousand miles away. When I heard that bass line, the way he his uh, his signature heavy bass and those uh, drums, and then I heard D'Angelo. Mm. Yeah. Way, no, the, no, these twos did not. D'Angelo and D and 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 Premier, no, they did not get on a collaboration together, and that was Devil's Man, Time. Man, I was like, whoa, that made niggas cook up. So, that made niggas cook up so much weight. That was the anthem at the time. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Crazy dog. Crazy for real. Yeah, man. But you know, but you know what, man? We about to uh, wrap this up shortly, man. But we definitely enjoyed the build. It's always a pleasure having you on on building with us, man. You care to tell us where to find your album and your social media handles? Man, you know, everything is Substance810. The website is Substance810.com. Uh, all the streaming platforms, Substance810. I make it real easy, you know what I mean? So you can find me uh, just like that. Easy. And buy that so, album, man. man. Stream it. Even yeah. buy the cassette, damn it. Because he's selling cassettes, too. Oh, shit. The, the okay, sub. I'm going to be in your DM you know I mean? about the, getting the, that, too. The, so the, the cassettes came out at, at um, 12 p.m. noon today. The cassettes are sold okay. out. It's like it's, it's maybe like five CDs, maybe four CDs left. Cause I, I made damn. Limited. So there was tw- it, it was 25 cassettes. Only twenty five, only twenty five made. So there's, those are all gone, and it's probably like fifty CDs made, and there's probably like five left. You know what I mean? But um, before we get out of it's, it's, it's a lot of projects. Here, so. I mean, but before we get out of here, on that note, man, how does it feel knowing that your shit moved that quick when you put it out there like that, and everybody went and got it? I mean, it's dope just to know like you can have your own website and move your product. Like all across the world, you know, that's a dope thing to me because it's like um, I never thought. Uh, I think I put out my first album on streaming platforms in like 2006, so I never mm-hmm. thought that I'd be like putting out vinyl and cassette tapes and CDs in 2022. Like I would have probably laughed at you if you told me that, but it's dope, man. Technology came so, so far that we can do the, do all of this independently, you know. So we're gonna have to add one for part three because because part three is gonna next time. This is gonna consist of, you know, what I'm saying, uh, how do you feel about how you know the CDs and hard copies and everything? How are they still viable, you know, in the game? You know, because a lot of but that's for another show that we're gonna have you back on at this. Oh, that's gonna then. be a great one. Yeah, that's a whole other yeah, show. Definitely, <clears throat> that's gonna be a great one. No doubt. Definitely, man. So, yeah, we definitely appreciate you for joining us, man. We're going to keep supporting what you're doing. You're definitely welcome to come back because, you know, we on the road to 500, son. We on 477 yeah. right here. I mean, we just been knocking out these episodes nonstop. We thank everybody for wow. tuning in and subscribing to the, to the YouTube channel. So when we hit 500, we're going to pop a lot of champagne. Yes. I'm going to pop with y'all, man. I appreciate y'all, man. No doubt. Man, man. We want to do the WrestleMania shit and make it two days. We got to be two straight days. Hey. We're a two straight day event. Get it up, man. I'm there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no man. doubt. So, let note, we out. Peace. Peace. God bless.